All right. Welcome, everybody, to today's uh, webinar about deep winter greenhouse tomato production trials. So today we'll be talking about our experiences with a limited two-year production trial growing tomatoes in deep winter greenhouses. So I am Greg Swazer. I'm with the University of Minnesota Extension's Regional Sustainable Development Partnerships. Today I'll be talking very briefly about what the deep winter greenhouse is, how it works, and then I'll hand it over to Natalie Hoydall, who's an extension horticulture expert at the University of Minnesota Extension. And then finally, Ryan Pesch is the University of Minnesota, University of Minnesota Extension Ag Business Management. We'll talk about the uh, deep winter greenhouse um, tomatoes uh, enterprise budget, and how well it fits into a deep winter greenhouse enterprise. Next slide. So here we have a deep winter greenhouse schematic design. If you can imagine the dotted line here is the um, sort of the exterior of the greenhouse. The way this works is that there's a south facing glazing angle on this sort of flat wall here. Uh, this, uh, this is a glazing wall, it's facing due south at about 45 degree angle from the, from the base here which at the latitude of 45 degrees uh, north, right around where Minneapolis is, this allows the maximum amount of sunlight into the greenhouse. And that solar heat fills the greenhouse, rises to the top, and is drawn into the underground through this uh, duct at the very peak of the greenhouse. Hot air is drawn underground and drawn through a four-foot bed of rock, crushed river rock, which is uh, which which heats up and the little air spaces between the rock heat up and that air is drawn out at night when the sun goes down and the, the building cools. This allows us to utilize that uh, heat we collect through the day through this sort of solar energy battery system and helps us create an environment where we can keep crops warm with limited uh, requirements for external heat. Although should be noted that all of these greenhouses do have a backup heater, which we uh, which comes on at night if the temperature drops below about 40 degrees in order to prevent the crops from freezing. Um, so uh, next slide, please. There, thank you. So here are a couple of examples. The bottom right greenhouse is one of an earlier greenhouse design. This is on the south side of a, um, of a garage. Uh, we worked with this particular grower over the over the years to improve on this design and to develop a design that is freestanding so anybody could uh, build this one, whether or not they have a, an optimal south-facing building that is clear of obstructions. So the one on the top right is our deep winter greenhouse 2.2 model. And then um, on the bottom left is our farm scale deep winter greenhouse model. This one is a newer design, and this is one of the two prototypes that we have built in Minneapolis here. Uh, this is, um, I think, last winter, this picture, it's not completely finished yet, does not yet have siding and a door on it. Right now, this is the first winter. This greenhouse is under um, is being used for production. Things are going pretty well, and um, yeah, that's those are our greenhouses. So, next slide, thanks. So, the project goals for our deep winter greenhouse tomato trials. Here we go. So, um, one thing that these greenhouses are very good at is creating an environment where people can grow winter greens very well. So, we're talking about brassicas, lettuces, um, Asian greens, various things that can grow in a salad green type of shape and size. These greenhouses are very good for that because they are cold at night, warm in the day, and those particular crops are able to um, sustain themselves in very low light, low heat situations. So um, growers using these greenhouses, we're trying to provide them with potential other crops. So we wanted to test to see if we could put tomatoes in there and provide these deeper to greenhouse producers with an opportunity to um, grow a crop that would be of high value in that early farmer's market season. So here in Minnesota, we figure if you can get tomatoes in a farmer's market in Minnesota in June, then you're going to be uh, raking it in because everybody's dying for tomatoes right now and they just aren't there. So uh, we wanted to see if we could uh, find a way to help these deeper to greenhouse growers uh, create a second crop. So um, we are we did these tests to look at tomatoes um, to see if it would work. We'll hear more about that shortly. Another thing is we want to find shoulder season uses for these greenhouses. We are optimizing these greenhouses for winter production, which means the uh, deep winter greenhouse is solely used in the winter. It shines in the winter, and we want to see if we can find uses for those other seasons. So um, in the late spring or early fall, 
and uh, provide more revenue generating opportunities for deep winter greenhouse producers. And then we wanted to see if the tomatoes were financially feasible, could growers grow tomatoes, but also make money doing it. Um, and then finally, we wanted to provide recommendations for growers who want to try growing tomatoes who can learn from our experiences and learn from uh, our failures both and to provide some hints for people who want to do further experimentation on their own. So we decided to grow these tomatoes in containers um, and that is not necessarily the best way to grow tomatoes but we did it that way because at least in Minnesota a lot of the deep winter greenhouses have landscape fabric on the floor. They're mostly growing in above ground containers and so that was consistent with how people are growing tomatoes here. So we used 10 gallon buckets. Um, we actually started with 20 gallon containers and realized that was overkill. So in the second year, we were able to go down to 10, um, used a starter fertilizer, and then had a weekly supplemental um, fertility plan. And we made that based on a soil test we did on that initial um, starter mix and the nutrient management recommendations for Minnesota. So we could make sure we were giving the plants everything they needed every week. And we decided to try it with a slicer tomato and a cherry tomato. Both of these varieties were bred for greenhouses. And so that's why we chose them. And the growers did a single liter um, pruning system. And then they used kind of different DIY trellising materials. They used uh, posts and like cattle panels that they already had at their farms. And so on the next slide, you'll see the main thing we were looking at was timing. So the goal was to get tomatoes as early as possible. Um, we have other great ways to produce tomatoes in Minnesota um, in high tunnels or in the field, but we typically don't start to get the first tomatoes until like mid-July or so, or even later. And so we wanted to see how early can we get tomatoes in these deep winter greenhouses to get that um, that kind of market edge, I guess. And so we tried planting in 2021 in February, March, and April, and we weren't actually sure that it was going to work to start growing tomatoes in February. If you've ever started your seeds too early, you know that they can get light stressed and kind of leggy. And so we weren't necessarily expecting that to work. But it did. It worked really well. And so actually in the second year, we pushed it even earlier, um, planting in January, February, and March. So we started them in flats and then up potted to a five gallon bucket and then up to a 10, um, just with the idea that that space is super valuable in January and February when you're growing greens. And so we wanted to keep the tomato footprint as small as possible, as long as we could um, until we had to go up to those 10 gallon pots. Thanks. All right, so let's look at some yield data. Um, so the first thing you might real, <laughs> realize is our yields were not great overall, um, but starting with this first colorful graph, you can see that across all three farms, um, the earlier we planted, the better they did. And so there was quite a bit of variability from farm to farm. Um, we did have some issues with blossom end rot, just because in a like a pot, it dries out really, really fast and it's hard to maintain adequate soil moisture. And so that was one problem. But overall, we had kind of low yields um, in a typical Minnesota high tunnel. You might expect more like five to ten pounds per plant with an average of maybe eight or nine pounds per plant. Um, here we were getting a maximum of two and a half. But one thing you'll notice, if you look at these graphs, so for each farm, there's a separate graph with the planting date um, and the, the kind of progression of harvest. So we started harvesting really early. We were harvesting in the beginning to mid part of June. Um, and then the growers actually kind of stopped harvesting midway through the season. It got really hot and they didn't really want to be in their deep winter greenhouses anymore. And by the time high tunnel tomatoes and field tomatoes started to kick in, it wasn't really worth it to keep paying a lot of attention to the tomatoes that they had in the greenhouse. And so that's one of the reasons these yields are low is that they stopped harvesting pretty early in the season. Whereas if you were growing in a high tunnel or outside, you would continue to harvest through September. And so basically what you can see from these graphs is that um, growers were getting tomatoes 
as early as mid-June, um, and that production kind of ramped up. And so while it wasn't a lot, for some of the growers, it was enough to be the first person at the market with tomatoes in June and for their stand to kind of stand out from the others. So if we look at 2022, on the next slide, thanks, Ryan. Um, our numbers were somewhat similar again, um, and we saw the same trend. So actually, one of the farms had a complete crop failure in 2022. We think because of watering issues, he actually had some tomatoes growing directly in the ground in a raised bed that did fine, but all of the tomatoes and pots died. Um, and we're pretty sure it just got too hot and it was too hard to keep them watered consistently. So in 2022, again, we saw the earlier tomatoes did the best um, with yield declines then every month after. The yields were a little bit lower um, in 2022. It was a really cold, dark, long spring. And so things were just a little bit slower to get started. Um, and again, we saw we started to harvest in early June uh, for those January tomatoes and kind of mid to late June for those February tomatoes. If we look at the slicers, um, they, again, there's a lot of farm variability here. The slicers were actually a lot more prone to blossom end rot um, as they tend to be. And so that's one of the reasons we had such low yields. Um, of marketable tomatoes at some of the farms. Um, but here it was a little bit more variable, but in general, it seemed like the February tomatoes did a bit better. They were a little bit later than cherry tomatoes, which makes sense. They're bigger, they take longer to form. And so we were getting slicer tomatoes more like end of June, early July. Um, and so it wasn't necessarily as ideal of a situation with the slicers. In 2022, um, they did better. So the growers kind of figured out, okay, we need to water a lot more than we think we do to manage blossom end rot um, and just plant stress. And so the yields were a little bit better, still kind of low, but with the January planting, they were getting about a pound per plant. Um, so again, a pound per plant. If you can start selling those in mid to late June at the farmer's market, that's going to be a whole month earlier than people have them Otherwise, and so Ryan's gonna, um, in a minute here, kind of transition and talk through the economics of that. So I have one final slide just with some, some limitations. So I've said this a few times, but growing in pots is always challenging and we definitely had our challenges with watering, um, but also with potting soil. Um, so this is something that we see kind of across the board. We've had a lot of issues with potting soil, at least in Minnesota over the last couple of years. Um, but the soil we used was really salty. So if you are using, or if you're going to be growing things in pots in your greenhouse, it's a really good idea to send that media in to a lab to get it tested. If you're in Minnesota, the U of M soil lab will do a media assessment. You find it under greenhouse. Um, and that electrical conductivity value is something to keep an eye on. At an EC of 3.3, you may start to see some plant stress issues and some germination issues, especially for seedlings. Tomatoes are pretty salt tolerant, but when they're seedlings, they're especially vulnerable. And so those were kind of the main limitations that we had. And then just the fact that the greenhouses got so hot in the summer that at some point people didn't really want to be in them. So that. Um, if anyone has a specific question about the growing methods, I can take a couple minutes to do that now. And otherwise, Ryan's going to take over and talk about what how this worked out from an economic perspective. Greg, do you hear us now? Oh, yeah, I hear you. <laughs> okay, okay. Good. Oh, very good. So if we pause a second here, if there's any particular production questions. You're looking at the chat. Maybe there are some. I don't see any questions in the chat at the moment. Anybody has any? Oh, here we go. They're starting to come in now. Was watering done by hand or drip irrigation? Yeah, good question. We were doing hand watering just because it was so few plants in this situation and because we were, um, we were fertigating. So we were dissolving the nutrients in the water and then 
applying them through watering. You can do all of that through a more automated drip system. So that's absolutely an option that if you were doing this on a larger scale, it would make sense to invest in a drip system probably. Um, but we didn't do that in this case. Okay. Um, uh, is there any information about in, on soil yeah. temperature? Yeah. yeah, we don't have soil temperature information. We did have sensors in the greenhouse. Um, so we are about to publish this report, which we can send out to everybody. And so we do have the relative humidity and temperature data from inside the deep winter greenhouses, um, but not in the soil. Okay, have we been doing something? Uh, we've been doing something similar in Wisconsin for almost 10 years. Here's a deeprootedorganics.com is our website. We'd love to compare data. Thank you for that. We'll mark this down and copy it somewhere. All right. Um, did you see if yields would extend into early winter? We didn't really. And again, the reason for that was like the growers just. It was really hot. They didn't really want to be in there anymore. Um, and they all started to get good yields of tomatoes outside and in their high tunnels. And so for them, it wasn't worth it to keep harvesting. Um, you potentially could, though. And that's if you're excited about it, I would encourage you to try. Um, and that kind of goes into this next question here. Could planting have been done in the late summer or early fall? Um, Again, like don't, I won't knock it until I try it, <laughs> I guess, but I would be really worried about light. So, and we even see that with greens. So plants that are planted in the fall, put on a lot of vegetative growth, and then they hit this Persephone period, we call it in the winter, where there's just not enough light for plants to really grow well. And so we see that even with like spinach and lettuce. And so I think that a tomato plant would really slow down and get light stressed, but we were surprised to see that we could plant in January without supplemental lighting. I mean, we had supplemental lighting to start the seeds, but after that we didn't and the plants did well. And so that was a surprise to us. Here you go. We're, we're growers tempering water to avoid cold shock, assuming groundwater with cooler temps. Yeah, I'm not sure about that, fortunately. I guess maybe Ryan, so Ryan has a deep winter greenhouse. Can you answer that question, Ryan? Do you do anything to get your water to a warmer temperature? No, I don't. But when you have a hose in a winter greenhouse, it always warms up. So at least the certain, I don't know, the first two minutes of water is pretty warm. <laughs> But that's not by intention. That just that just <laughs> what happens, frankly. And we only had a few plants. And so, yeah, we had um, how many? We had like 12 plants per species. So, so maybe we got through that warm water. All right. What was the solution to the blossom end rot? Um, good question. So blossom end rot happens when... Um, when plants are growing too fast, basically, there's cell division happening really rapidly in the fruit and calcium cannot make it in time to the end of that fruit. Calcium is really slow. Uh, my colleague Marissa refers to it as the bag lady on the plane. Like it, it's trying to get through this really small passageway and it's just big and clunky and it can't get there in time. Um, and so the we often try to treat it with calcium, thinking it's a calcium deficiency, but it's really a failure to move calcium. And so the, the main way to deal with blossom end rot is to keep really consistent irrigation and soil moisture because um, calcium is moving through water. And so um, in a pot, that environment can dry up really, really fast. And in a deep winter greenhouse, especially, it's so warm that that can be even faster and so people found that they had to water multiple times a day um, just because it's such a small volume of soil to root mass. So that is the blossom end rot solution. If you're seeing a lot of it, it's worth doing a soil test to make sure you have enough soil calcium. But most of the time, especially if you're in the Midwest, you probably will have enough soil calcium. Well, um, if growing in pots, any reason they didn't want to move outdoors when it was too hot? Honestly, I think it was just a feasibility, like practicality, like 
issue. The plants got really big and they had these like trellis systems on them and it would have just been kind of clunky to move them all out. Um, and again, like if this was your only way that you were growing tomatoes, you could totally do that. Um, I think for the folks in this trial, they just, they also had high tunnels and they also had field tomatoes and it wasn't worth that effort during the summer when they were really busy with their other farming operations. Great. All right. And then do we vent the deep winter greenhouse in the summer as well? I'll just take that in the summer. They typically are used, they're we're sealed up to um, kill germs inside. So they typically aren't used in the summer for production purposes. So they don't need to be vented. It'd be the opposite of what, what, what we're doing with them here. So um, the next one is power requirements of the greenhouse um, and paired with backup heaters kicked on at night. It depends on the amount of sun. Uh, the winters vary between sunny every day to cloudy. When it's cloudy, the backup heater kicks on a little bit off and on at night to keep it up to that level. Um, so it depends on the type of greenhouse and the and the uh, and the cloudiness. Um, usually, not very. And the smaller greenhouses barely any heat's used at all, but a little bit. Um, and then that's essentially the power question there. Um, Trials to combine both the below ground heat storage coupled with the water tank storage. Um, the fast answer to that is no, <laughs> unfortunately, not at the moment. Um, okay, I'd like to uh, stop the questions there for now and we'll move on to Ryan um, and then we'll have more room for more questions in about 15 or 20 minutes here. Great. I'm a wordy person, but I'm going to be concise today. And um, so greetings from Otter Tail County. <laughs> um, so as Natalie laid out the, the production as my role to um, take those production numbers and take the costs that we use, were related to the trials and just say, okay, how, how did this lay out? And, um, and really our situation here is we have both high cost and low yield, <laughs> really. Um, so I think really the, the the question, you know, there's some questions there about growing in pots and some challenges with pots. Um, and so this, this that really was the production system, right? We're growing in 10 gallon pots in the winter greenhouse to try to complement the greens that are being grown there. So boy, what is what does this turn turn out to be? So if you see here on the left, um Basically, the way laid out is on average, if I just looked, we said slicers, no go, <laughs> just performed worse than cherry tomatoes. So let's only look at the cherry tomatoes. That might be a viable option here. And so if we looked at the last year, let's look at January and February. You saw that those yields were higher. <clears throat> and let's not look at March. And so if we looked at January and February yields on a per plant basis, that was like 20.2 ounces. Okay. So in terms of marketing, and those were marketable fruit. So overall, that is, like Natalie said, a fairly low yield. Um, if we think of marketing those, cherry tomatoes are typically marketed in a 12-ounce pint. And so that's kind of how I thought about this. Let's price these out at a reasonable $5 a pint. And total revenue at this average uh, per plant is $8.42 uh, per tomato. Uh, and then the big challenge is here is let's look at the operating cost. So we have a low yield, even at a $5 per pint um, revenue. Uh, the big issue is our soil mix, right? There's a uh, the 10 gallon pot and and the purple cow that we use is a fairly expensive mix that added up. <laughs> and so we also put in an ownership cost, which is just the depreciation over 20 years uh, for a $26,000 greenhouse and just looked at it in terms of uh, each tomato plant taking up two square feet. And, you know, our return over total is dismal, right? There's a dismal return. Uh, so if we looked at it on a per square foot basis, we just cut things in half because we use two, two square feet. Uh, it's half that amount, $9.52 negative. Uh, and then just compared that to winter greens, uh, which we've collected a lot of data on, and we've updated it to $12 per pound, um, which is still, maybe a bit low, but it's it's positive. Uh, and in comparison to our tomatoes, it doesn't look good. So what's driving the costs? The big thing is this potting mix, right? 
um, you know, it's costing us about $150 per cubic yard. And so, geez, it just adds up like 17 bucks in potting, potting mix in a pot. Um, and we still got these problems uh, growing in it. So that's how we get to this, this high cost uh, per plant. Uh, we also took the cost of the pots, which themselves weren't cheap. Um, and I just said, hey, let's let's just say these things have a five year life. And so we have an annual cost of a dollar, dollar seventy eight potting soil of 1732. That's the big one. Seed. No big deal here. Uh, and then we just allocated utilities uh, based on uh, total um, utility costs and heating costs for the greenhouses. And uh, we only looked at a portion of the year because these things are started, say, the second half of of winter, not the entire winter. So, boy, this is crazy, right? We just have expensive mix. Maybe that's our problem. So let's let's look at it with a different mix, uh, in a in a more uh, reasonable cost mix. Um, so we just took a look at uh, Metro Mix by SunGrow. So it again, it's it, it's a non organic mix. Uh, buying it in 1544 for a 2.8 cubic foot bag, kind of these standard commercial bags if you will, um, compared to our expensive uh, purple cow here uh, and that we bought in large totes and had to pay to get them transported uh, to farm. And so even with that, we're it's still not looking good, folks, right? So if we look at the return over total costs, um, yeah, we, we, we got a lot closer uh, to hitting profitability, uh, but even with the Metro Mix, we didn't. There's just Hey, we're we're using ten gallon ten gallons. We're, we're, you're basically getting two pots out of each bag, if you will, in terms of filling them up. Uh, so we're still losing, you know, nine nine bucks uh, per per uh, per plant. Um, I did calculate with the purple cow our break even on a per pint basis on that average um, yield would be about sixteen dollars and thirty one cents per pint of cherry tomatoes. So that doesn't work either. Um, you could maybe recalculate with that highest, highest example, that January of 2022, but I still think we're gonna fall short. Um, but we might be beginning to break even if we're doing that two and a, two and a half pounds. Um, and we also uh, are using the Metro mix. So really one of the questions uh, that's, that we're looking at uh, with winter greenhouses is, can this be a complementary uh, enterprise? And let's see what it would look like if we fit this complementary enterprise into a winter greenhouse. And so what we have here are just three scenarios about uh, how it lays out, if you will, if we're dedicating a great, a small amount of space and then a bigger amount of space and then the whole space or an entire uh, 345 a square foot growing space greenhouse. And uh, and as you can tell from the previous slides, uh, basically as you take out greens and you put in unprofitable tomatoes, we just lose more and more money the more space we dedicate to the tomatoes. So this is a very dismal picture I'm painting for you all. Uh, but again, these are just based on our costs related to these trials in, in 2022 with two operators. So uh, I do think one of the things that uh, we started talking about in terms of, boy, just we don't necessarily, do we necessarily have to squeeze the greens out in order to make room for these tomatoes? Um, certainly they're started in January. Uh, this notion of, I like to use the term the understory, right? So this is my, <laughs> this is my greenhouse with greens growing in it. Uh, which is kind of in the shelf situation. There's always light coming through into this understory. We still have a nice, warm, heated environment. It's a good growing environment. And as Natalie pointed out when we were discussing these results, she's like, you know, it doesn't, when these things are small seedlings, these are not taking up space. We don't necessarily need to carve out a third of the greenhouse in order to get these things to grow. Uh, they may fit in some of these underutilized spaces in the deep winter greenhouse. And 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 that's absolutely true. So you you these scenarios where I'm taking space away from the greens maybe don't make sense. Maybe we can start these uh, tomatoes uh, in that understory 
and get that six to eight week growth without kind of displacement, if I could spell displacement, obviously, don't, don't look at that. Um, and it could truly complement that is we could take advantage of these early uh, cherry tomato sales, uh, albeit if they're just uh, kind of a uh, not that heavy of a yield and, uh, and still get them to the market and not necessarily uh, displace our, our greens production. So when I start thinking about uh, the recommendations, you know, maybe the first one is don't, <laughs> right? Our friends in Wisconsin, they've got, they've got it all figured out after 10 years and they're going to tell us, I don't know, you guys got it all wrong, uh, what you're doing here. Um, but certainly I think in order to make it uh, profitable and productive is really about how do we adapt that production system and get it to complement as opposed to substitute out uh, those greens. And so you Natalie talked about in terms of the trials started with 15 or 20 gallon pots year one went down to 10 gallon pots. Okay. That didn't seem to uh, change results significantly. Is there, is there opportunity to use less soil per plant? Is there opportunity to use soil in a raised bed situation that might be sort of uh, used uh, soil mix with some amendments uh, that would really decrease that cost uh, for uh, for soil mix. Uh, again, using the underutilized space. Um, and somebody even asked about this in this uh, in in the question and answer. You know, is there some way we we can start pots in uh, the winter greenhouse and move out at some type of maturity, uh, maybe before fruiting happens? Uh, because as Nat is talking about, you know, one big issue is these things get really hot. Um, and and I know for our own greenhouse, yep, we we got venting, but you could vent that thing 24-7 all day long. You the vent will be on all the, it, it usually is on all all of May or a lot of May uh during the day. And uh once we start getting into July, um, how can we grow in there well? It's difficult uh for both humans and for plants, uh, when we have some serious spikes in temperature, uh, I think even with some significant venting. So maybe there is an opportunity uh, to make this, to still take advantage of the winter greenhouse early when the winter greenhouse is performing well uh, and get those plants out in a place where they will perform better uh, outside. So um, Greg, were you giving the takeaways or, or these are the main, you want me to do the main takeaways? You uh, go for it. Okay trying to encapsulate this water more than you think you need to, right? Right, Natalie? Um, this, we, there's significant blossom and rot issue, as Nan's talking about. In year one, uh, growers figured it out by year two, and, and really a lot of it came down to very consistent uh, watering and a lot of watering. Um, the earlier and better in terms of yield and earlier than this, yep, if uh, maybe we got to plant these things at the very, very end, like plant them on New Year's Day or something, uh, right before Christmas or something like that uh, in order to get uh, uh, increased yield and get it as, as early as, as possible. And certainly uh, as I just been yammering about here, it's like uh, the, the potting soil issue is, is a real issue. So uh, we'll need to figure that out in order to make it, make it work. So that's all I have. Just no fun. Great. Well, there's some questions for you, some pretty good ones. Are you ready? Sure. All right. So grown in ground would potentially cost only 81 cents instead of 1991 as the potted ones did, right? Yeah. Grown, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, that's, you know, you, you, you might have a fertility cost, um, but again, it, it'd be significantly less, I'm sure, uh, than, than fresh potting, potting mix. Um, again, what's common for us in winter greenhouses is, you're doing greens and you're, at least this is what I do. I, I'm, I'm always composting uh, soil mix on the ground in a pile and I'm adding it to raised beds and such. Uh, so even after the greens have, you know, they've done their thing, it's spent soil mix. A, it's still a good medium. Uh, uh, and I still think there's some uh, some fertility in there. So I think if, if you took that medium and you're adding uh, some organic fertilizer, whether it's some blood meal and bone meal, that's pennies compared to buying purple cow and 10 pound pots, no doubt. Yeah, I just note that a lot of greenhouses aren't um, doing raised beds. So um, this is kind of a, a remedy for that. So the ones we worked with, uh, two of them didn't have raised beds. So 
Um, we did them in pots because otherwise we weren't going to do it. But um, yeah, I think that the next the next test, I think, would probably be, I think that would make a lot of sense. Although I don't know that that's totally compatible with the greens production, but it might make sense right on its own anyway. So um, good question there. The next one, um, would it be more feasible if you're able to use compost made on site versus buying potting soil? For sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, I would always just warn, I mean, I've, I've grown, I've dealt with a fair amount of compost. Um, I've ended up started buying compost because I'm just not good at it. Right. Uh, I think there's a lot to be said about making good compost, uh, and also making compost that isn't going to introduce some strange thing to the, uh, to the winter greenhouse. This is a very controlled environment. And I know myself early on, I had a very similar idea. It's like, I can't wait to like, I'm going to be composting in the winter greenhouse because I'm just going to be, I'll be building a, a, a value added product at the same time I'm growing greens. This is double duty. But the, the amount of aphids I seem to have introduced that year was absolutely ridiculous. Um, and, and I learned like, uh oh, yep, I am doing that. There's a positive, but there's also this very strong negative. <laughs> so I don't know, Natalie, you got any... I mean, economically, this is making sense, but I mean, there can be some drawbacks of production. Yeah, and or, aphids and fungus gnats were the things that came to my mind. So making sure you're managing that. And then also, um, if, if you're going to do that, that's great. And it's worth it to probably send that compost to a lab for a fertility analysis, at least if you're doing this on a large scale. Um, I see people all the time, like in hydroponics and in this kind of growing, either way over fertilizing or way under fertilizing. And in either case, like either you're spending a lot of money on fertilizers that you don't need to be spending or your plants are not growing well. And so it's worth doing that test. And your local extension people should hopefully be able to help you come up with a fertility program then for supplementing whatever is in that compost or potting soil. Just note for Ryan's reasons and others, we typically dis uh, encourage. We do not encourage people to use compost they make in their greenhouses. It can cause a lot of fungus, uh, fungus and pest problems. But if you're going to do it, get it tested and and do the best job you can. Um, next here, um, why didn't you include labor costs in your analysis, Ryan? Because it was so dismal looking at just the direct costs. If I added the labor costs, it would look even worse. <laughs> So, I mean, it's clear looking at these numbers, this isn't very profitable. Uh, we have we have used labor costs and labor costs are included in uh, some of the deep winter greenhouse uh, reports we did uh, with greens. All right. So comparing outdoor versus greenhouse tomato plants, did you find the greenhouse plants to be less sturdy? That's a Natalie question. Not necessarily. Um... I think that's a hard question to answer just because it's such a different system like we were pruning um to one liter and like trellising them in a way that like in an outdoor system you're probably using a different trellising system you're probably pruning differently and so it's hard to make a direct comparison i don't know if ryan do you have any additional thoughts on that no i have any additional thoughts but i had an additional question how tall do these <laughs> things get they got they, tall. They were, um, and that's probably another reason people stopped harvesting them. Um, I think they were probably at like six, seven feet. I mean, you can, your tomatoes can get a lot taller than that if you let them keep going in a tunnel, but people stopped early enough in the season that they weren't like massive. And that, but that's something to think about if you wanted to keep going um you would probably want to be figuring out like a, an infrastructure that would allow you to properly trellis from like the roof of your greenhouse just because trying to like set up a trellising system with cattle panels and stuff isn't going to work for the entire summer okay what about hydroponics well, what about them so i know quite a not quite a few but a few people who have started doing hydroponics in their tunnels, mostly due to bacterial canker in the soil. Um, and I think it's 
it's almost the same setup. Typically when people do hydroponic tomatoes in a greenhouse setting, I guess you could do like the bucket methods, but often people have like the bags of coconut core and then they're planting like along a row in those bags and trellising like you would in a standard um, coop house system. And it's kind of the same idea. It's a pot. Like you have this media that the roots are growing into and you have to be supplementing all of the fertility through fertigation. Um, it's almost the same system, I think. And in some ways the irrigation is easier because you can get irrigation systems more tailored to that. Um, so I guess I'd say, why not? And it might be cheaper. <laughs> Ryan, do you have any thoughts on that? I guess that, that's what I was thinking too. I haven't added up all the, the costs related to a hydroponic system, but I got to think it would be cheaper <laughs> than, than the, the potting mix situation. Um, and certainly the, the purple cow example. And granted, you can spend a ton of money on startup costs for a hydroponic system. <laughs> like that encompasses a lot of things, especially if you're doing like an infrastructure heavy system. But if you're just using like the bags of core and then like a drip system that you're fertigating into, I think, yeah, it would be a comparable setup and probably cheaper. Yeah, I think it's also worth noting. We, these are very small trials. They're two, sm two, three small greenhouses, two small greenhouses, and a large one. There are definitely ways we would do it if we were to do it over again, and it would probably include some of these things. But we just tried one narrow thing to see how it would work, and well, you're hearing how it didn't work. So yeah, if you're going to do this on your own, there's some good uh, ideas here on on how to go about that. All right. So another comment here. We run into similar issues, but are doing much different things. We use five gallon bags and fertigation and we grow through the season, but no greens in the winter. The soil costs are a problem, but labor is the real problem for us. So that's a good point. I don't know if anybody wants to comment on that. Um, and then um, assuming that the goal is increasing the variety of known species, being able to be successfully grown in the deep winter greenhouse, um, what other growing variables or even plant species are being tested now or are you thinking about trying in the future? I don't know if either of you have thoughts. I've got one thought, but I'll wait to see if Go you have thoughts. Go for it, um, Right now, it looks to, seems to be that one of the things that people are finding is um, a good shoulder season or an additional crop is bedding plants. Um, people are growing greens until about, you know, now and then growing those starts for sale or to put right into their their um, summer farms. And uh, people are making, I think, uh, decent money doing that. So, um, so you have your green season and then you have your bedding plant season. And I think that would be something I might recommend it, or, you know, maybe we should look into do some investigating into, you know, a full uh um, revenue uh, model based on greens and bedding plants, but that looks to be something promising. Another thing that people are doing are um, uh, microgreens and pea shoots and sunflower shoots. Um, it works really well. I would question whether there's a broad market for those types of things, but uh, people are doing those and um, the, the people that are doing those seem to be happy with the results. So that's what we have for now. Um, another thing is some people experiment with uh, using in the summer, using their greenhouses as food dehydrators. So taking berries and apples and things like that and slicing them up and dehydrating them in their greenhouse. Um, commercially, that might be a, a regulatory headache, but um, it's certainly something that's possible. So if anybody wanted to go try to figure that out, something that could be done. Um, all right. Can next I say year. something about bedding plants yep. that I've learned the hard way? <laughs> One of the like, the really important rules in greenhouse management is not mixing bedding plants and vegetables in the same greenhouse. And if you're doing it at different times, it's fine. Like finishing your lettuce or greens, then doing bedding plants, then having this like sterilization period. But they're very prone to thrips and to like viruses and diseases that carry over into your vegetables. Um, so anytime we have like bedding plants in the same greenhouse as like tomatoes or peppers, we see a lot of viruses. And so just be mindful of that if you want to do it. And that's why that summer period then where you have kind of like a sterilization, like kill everything in the greenhouse period would be helpful with that. 
All right. Thanks for that. Um, here's one maybe for you, Ryan. Uh, when did your greens bolt from the heat? Um, well, you know, my, not necessarily from, from the heat, it seems like, you know, the plants would get stressed even after, a say we're, we do multiple cuttings, right? So first cutting, we don't have like a lot of bolting. Um, second cutting, you can get some bolting third cutting. It's like bolt city. It all bolts. And it doesn't matter <laughs> the time of year. So I, I, for example, I just, I gave up on third cuttings. It's just really not worth it. It's like a law of diminishing returns, but in this, in season here, um, you know, I mean, you do get more bolting, I'd say about this time of year, but we're also timing it out so that, you know, these things are going out the door. Right. Um, so it doesn't bother me. <laughs> um, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say we're getting bolting because of heat stress. I think if you tried growing greens into, you know, April and May, or you're studying them now into May, uh, you, you get so much heat, um, in, in a May environment, I would think you would get some serious bolting just because of the, the heat stress. Right. Uh, it's my thoughts. Thanks there. Um, how are we managing aphids and fungus gnats and tomato plants? I don't think we had too many problems with them in this trial. Um, I think that maybe one reason people do put the landscape fabric on the bottom of the greenhouse. Um, also just making sure you're not over watering. So that's kind of the challenge. Like <laughs> you have to be constantly watering and watering enough, but we tend to have issues with fungus gnats when there's too much soil moisture. Um, in addition to that, like having really good ventilation is key, plenty of airflow. Um, I don't know how many people in Minnesota are using uh, predator insects, but I think that's one great solution that's underutilized is just to like have a supply of beneficial insects living in your greenhouse. Ryan or Greg, do you know if that's something a lot of people are doing? Yeah, um, ladybugs for aphids. You get to buy them from a company in California because they're not um, they're not in season here, so you have to kind of seek them out. But um, buy a bag of ladybugs and let them free. Yeah, I I still routinely have have aphid issues, and I don't know if it's from my initial starting a massive colony in 2014, and then they just keep keep on living along there in this greenhouse or not or if it just simply I, I i keep thinking like you know aphid aphid eggs are everywhere like any any soil mix that's coming in there's something um so i routinely have it we routinely do ladybugs but that also routinely never fully controls uh them on the tomatoes uh if you will you know so for me it's uh here in otter tail county they're fully under control once they get outside to harden off and then it's it's dragonfly zone, and that's it's actually kind of neat too, when you see the dragonflies just come and sweep over, uh, you know, the area where I have these things hardening off quite a bit. And usually, then aphids are a non-issue uh, once we get into the field. Uh, but of course, that's different than leaving these tomatoes in the greenhouse the whole time. Um, if there's a significant aphid population, um, then you'd have to do something. I've, I, I have used pyganic when, when it is uh, significant. Right. Ladybugs are, they're preventative. They're not going to like cure an aphid outbreak once it's there. But you also um, want to be careful about reading labels so that if you are using an insecticide, it's like safe to use in a greenhouse. I shouldn't say safe, but it's like labeled to use in a greenhouse setting and you're following the right restrictions about like how long you should stay out of the greenhouse after the application, things like that. Great. I think we're going to start to run out of time on some of the questions here. So maybe I'll try to like weed through them and find the uh, tomato ones uh, first here. So semi-determinate variety or pruned to shorter um, height. <laughs> can we come back to this question so I can just quick look up the variety and make sure I say the right thing? Sure. Um, while you're looking up the variety um, and har harvesting fruit in February were possible, would there be more of market value? Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, no, no doubt, no doubt. And and I, I just to say a point about, you know, sort of where these things start coming in, because I think Natalie's point about, you know, it starts to get hot enough. We have two things going on. One, we have this heat issue that stresses the plant, and then there isn't any more fruit, right, in this environment. But there's also this issue of like, at some point, you just go to high tunnel tomatoes, like high tunnel tomatoes come in. And the premium is before those high tunnel tomatoes are in, um, we have this window. So it's like anything before that window, you're good to go. And the further behind that window, you're all the better. Um, so at least thinking about like Minnesota pricing, you know, for a long time, we're sitting around $4 a pint is kind of a standard sort of farmer's market retail pricing. Four or $5, I don't think would be unreasonable. You know, um, can you sell these things at six? I'm sure, <laughs> right? When it's, people are very hungry for cherry tomatoes, but at some point it also taps out there. You start kind of like, kind of like your microgreens example. People like microgreens, but at a certain, you're always going to hit a, a price point at which even the greatest supporters of local and the most hungry for cherry tomatoes are going to say, I'm out. Uh, there'll always be, uh, you know, the high, you know, the, the, the well-heeled, I don't know, Mercedes drivers or something who's like, I'll pay whatever it is, you know, it's like 12 bucks a pint. I don't know. But that's an exception rather than the rule. You're, you're even, even super early, you're going to hit a point at which people are gonna be like, eh, you know, that's eight bucks. I can't do it. Um, so it's probably somewhere I would surmise if I put my marketing hat on, uh, between four and eight dollars. <laughs> where you're doubling the price after which even super early, I don't know if it would, it would fly, frankly. That's just my take. I, I have no research to back that up. So, All right, Natalie, can you answer the uh, variety question here? Yes. So they were both determinate varieties that were both specifically bred for tunnels and greenhouses. So that's why we chose them. We knew that trellising was going to be an issue. Um, so we chose determinates. They still get pretty tall. Like these are still greenhouse varieties. They were, I think I said six or seven feet tall, um, but they, yes, we chose determinants for a reason. All right, as we are wrapping up here, a couple more minutes, just real quick. Uh, there's a question about shade cloth. I know that the greenhouse growers are using shade cloth. Um, I know Brooke does. I don't remember if Grandpa G's, or if the other one was doing it or not, but um, shade cloth is being used. So that's, in addition, it still gets hot. Um, would the deep winter greenhouse be warm enough in January for tomatoes to grow well if you added solar powered LED supplemental lighting, which would add supplemental heat to? Um, I'll let you guys address that real quick, though. I just want to say these, a lot of these greenhouses are, um, are, People don't like to use extra lighting for various reasons. One of them is um, people don't want to add extra inputs. Another one is sometimes these greenhouses are really kind of uh, messy. There's a lot of stuff growing everywhere and it's hard to find good places to put the lights and watering can interfere with that. However, I think people should figure it out. So <laughs> if either of you two want to address the lighting question for January tomatoes, that might be a good one. I mean, I guess I'll just start out by saying that we did start them in January and they, they did quite well, at least at the farm that, that grew them. And we started the, the seeds under lights, um, but then didn't have extra supplemental lighting. So I think we can't necessarily say that conclusively, but if you wanted to push it and start them earlier and try to add some supplemental lighting, that's definitely something you could try. Um, I know there is a limit. <laughs> I um, I did my like studies in Denmark and we tried to grow things in the greenhouses in the winter with lighting and everything was really light stressed, <laughs> no matter how much supplemental lighting we added. But Denmark's a lot darker than Minnesota. And so I think we're still kind of pushing that envelope to try to figure out like how much light do we actually need and how far can we push these things? All right. Static deep water hydroponics might be ideal for this. I don't know if any of you know anything about that or have a comment about that. It could be. <laughs> um, I think at a commercial scale, I worry a little bit about static deep water hydroponic systems. Like I have seen 
I have seen greenhouses where like on a really hot day, the plants went through all the water and it just like died because people weren't keeping, um, keeping the, the buckets or whatever, um, containers they were using like watered enough or checking on them enough. Um, I think also at a commercial scale, you want to have some sort of aeration in there. Um, but if it's like a, a project you're trying at home kind of for fun, um, you could definitely try it. Either way, I'd say start on a small scale and see how it goes before you scale up. Okay, we've got, um, we're at time here. So um, if there's real, well, there's one question that might be really quick here. Um, Ryan, I don't know if you know this. Uh, what's the minimum amount of time to close up your greenhouse for sterilization in the summer? I, I don't know. Yeah, don't know. Um, maybe a month, maybe two. <laughs> Not sure either. I know Carol knows, but she's she's watching from the sidelines here, shouting out the answer into, into the, um, the ether. So <laughs> I mean, every, um, sorry, every, everybody has them closed. As most folks have them closed in four to five months, really. I mean, that's yeah. so all winter. Well, it, well, maybe open up into October or, or all summer and open up in October. So, okay. Well, Carol says two months at least in the summer. And okay. um, with that, I'd like to thank you all for joining us. Uh,